Hello, my name is Michael Duff and I'm Emeritus Professor of Theoretical Physics at Imperial College London. I'd like to talk to you about the Pakistani physicist and Nobel laureate Abdus Salam. <clears throat> I was his PhD student at Imperial from 1969 to 1972, fellow faculty member from 1979 to 1988 and the Abdus Salam Professor of Theoretical Physics from 2006 to 2015. I've written extensively about Salam, given numerous lectures about his work, and organised two international conferences dedicated to his memory. His death in 1996 was a great loss, not only to his family and the physics community, it was a loss to all mankind. For he was not only one of the finest physicists of the 20th century, having unified two of the four fundamental forces of nature, but he also dedicated his life to the betterment of science and education in the developing world. His legacy continues at the International Centre for Theoretical Physics in Trieste, now the Abdus Salam Centre, which he founded in 1966. The Imperial College Library was recently named the Abdus Salam Library. So I was saddened to hear from my colleague Pervez Hoodboy that extremists have forced the cancellation of an Abdus Salam Science Festival at Kaidi Azam University in Islamabad and put out videos on YouTube claiming he was not deserving of the Nobel Prize that he shared with Sheldon Glashow and Steven Weinberg in 1979. Critics of Salam's Nobel tend to fall into three categories. The first are ignorant non-scientists whose objections are so manifestly political or theological they cannot be taken seriously from a scientific point of view. Their ability to cause trouble must be taken seriously, of course. The second category are mediocre physicists who hope that by attacking Salam they can attract the sort of attention they fail to attract during their physics careers. And the third category are serious physicists, notably Glashow. The troubling development is that Group 1 are now quoting Groups 2 and 3 to shore up their arguments. In particular, a 2011 attack on Salam by physicist Norman Dombey and a 2020 interview with Glashow. My purpose here is to refute these claims, so let us begin with a brief summary of the circumstances surrounding the 1979 prize. Up until the 1960s, it was believed that there were four fundamental forces in nature. The strong nuclear force, the electromagnetic force, the weak nuclear force and the gravitational force. The electromagnetic force is understood very well as being mediated by an elementary particle called the photon. The mathematics was based on something called a U1 gauge group. Julian Schwinger, Glashow's PhD supervisor, suggested that perhaps there was an analogous explanation for the weak force. But there were major obstacles. What was the right gauge group? How to account for the fact that the electromagnetic force is a long-range force, whereas the weak force is short-range? And how to make sure the theory passes a consistency check called renormalizability? The story as seen by the Nobel Committee, and one that I agree with, is as follows. In 1961, Glashow suggested the right gauge group was SU2 cross U1, which described both weak and electromagnetic forces. There were four mediating particles, the photon, the Z0, the W plus and the W minus. But Glashow failed to explain the short range of the weak force in a way compatible with renormalizability, and his model was, temporarily at least, forgotten. Then in 1967, Weinberg realised that the missing ingredient was the Higgs boson, introduced in 1964. 
Working independently, Salam arrived at the same conclusion, publishing in 1968. However, this Weinberg Salam model still attracted little attention until 1972, when to Hoof proved its renormalizability. The W and Z were discovered in 1982 and the Higgs in 2012. Nobel Prizes frequently become politicized, with candidates jostling for pole position. For example, Glashow terminated his lifelong friendship with Weinberg because he had omitted Glashow's name from a talk about weak interactions in Tokyo. Weinberg, in his turn, insisted that Glashow remove some negative comments about the Weinberg Salar model from a talk in Stockholm. He didn't. Meanwhile, Salam was doing his own politicking by getting senior physicists such as Paul Dirac to write to the Nobel Committee expressing their support. There's nothing wrong with this. Uh, the Nobel Committee solicits dozens of such letters. Yet Glassow claims in his interview, quote, So why did Salam get the Nobel Prize? Very simply, he was nominated many times. Because he was director of the International Center for Theoretical Physics in Trieste, Italy, and he was very close with the directors of physics institutes in many countries, almost a hundred of different institutions. He continues, So the question arises, what did Salam do? He introduced the electroweak SU2 cross U1 model in 1964. That was over three years after I did. He copied my work, but did not cite me. Similar complaints have been made by the British physicist Norman Dombey in 2011. They were referring to a 1964 paper by Salam and Ward, who also suggested SU2 cross U1. Although Salam and Ward claim to have been unaware of Glashow's much forgotten paper, they do say, quote, particularly we'd like to mention Dr. S. L. Glashow, who has expressed similar ideas to us privately." End quote. But in a way it really makes no difference because the prize was awarded to Salam for his 1968 paper, not for his 64 paper with Ward. As Glashow himself concedes, the surprising thing in 1979 was not that Weinberg and Salam got the prize for the Weinberg-Salam model, but that Glashow was included. Quote, only after our award did the Weinberg Salam theory become the Glashow Salam Weinberg theory. Moreover, as we learn from an email from Glashow to Dombey, this came about only because of an 11th hour intervention by Murray Gell-Mann, arguably the world's most influential theoretical physicist, with powerful friends in Stockholm. Now, don't get me wrong, in hindsight, Gell-Mann was absolutely right. And in my opinion, all three, Glashow, Salam and Weinberg, were worthy winners. But Shelley, with his help from Galman, can hardly complain about Abdus, with his help from Dirac. So neither of his objections, Salam's nominations, nor the Salam Ward paper, is a valid reason for withholding the prize. Since Weinberg's paper was 1967, and Salam's paper 1968, the question of independence has arisen. I arrived at Imperial in 1969, but Bob Del Borgo organized the lectures given by Salam in 1967. And in 2016, he recalls how Salam set out the electroweak unification based on an SU2 gross U on gauge theory with the Higgs boson solving the long short range riddle. He conjectured correctly that his model was renormalizable. Del Borgo quote says, The resulting model looked rather ugly, and it still is, and I admit that I paid little attention to it, nor do I think that Salam himself was especially enraptured by the model's beauty. A week or so later, I wandered into the physics library and came across Stephen Weinberg's physical review letter, which I noticed looked suspiciously like Salam's attempt. I showed the article to Salam, who was rather troubled that this was almost the same as his own research, but which was, of course, entirely independent. 
Matthews and I urged him to publish his work at the earliest opportunity, and this happened to be the upcoming Nobel Symposium. As they say, the rest is history. I hope that this account of the events at the time scotches all aspersions that Salam should not have been a prize recipient." End quote. Well, Salam and Weinberg are no longer with us, but I knew Steve Weinberg quite well, and he was always very gracious about Salam's contributions before and after the prize. Why, I wonder then, is Shelley, now in his 90s, still so bitter? I got to know Shelley and his wife Joan on my annual visits to the Physics Summer School in Sicily, organised by Nino Zucchiki. The beach was an hour and a half away, so we had plenty of time to chat when they would give me a ride in their rental car. So I count him as a friend and professionally hold him in high regard. We never discussed his disputes with Weinberg and Salam, but I will hazard a guess. I think in part, Glashow's problem with Salam was guilt by association. Shelley's number one enemy was Weinberg, and he resented Salam and Weinberg cozying up and excluding him. Thank you very much. <laughs>